WTS presents 3, 2, 1 All the Feelings This episode Change Welcome one and all to the first episode of our brand spanking new spin-off podcast WTS presents All the Feelings as Pete and I explained in our trailer, we are branching off from our usual anxiety-drenched format to cover a range of different feelings and emotions. Each week, we'll tackle something that makes us humans, well, human. And it seems fitting that for our inaugural episode of this new exploration, we talk about change and the feelings that go along with it. Change. Noun. The act or instance of making or becoming different. Thanks, Robot Pal. So, Pete, how are you feeling before we just branch off into this? And I'm going to keep saying the word branch off apparently every sentence. How are you feeling about this change so far to our shift in the podcast? I'm nervous. about. I'm an weirdly anxious, what? ironically yep. anxious about yep. it. Right. It gives us more to talk about. And yet uh, and, and I think just in, in the research that I've been doing so far for the things I want to talk about this week, uh, I'm excited about it and I'm really interested in it. And it does indeed make me question things about myself and yep. how I relate to the world. So that's all good. But it, we've got like paint in our logo now. And that all of that makes me so <laughs> nervous. I know we have such a bigger canvas and such a bigger shovel in yes. which to bury ourselves with. So for we'll sure. Sure. And I just wanted to point off one of the things that we've talked about off the air. Uh, right off the bat, we bought all the domain names and branding for all the feelings and only then realized that all the feelings shares its acronym with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. So right off the bat, no notes. Pete and Tommy. Best idea. Back Best at it. idea. I know. Outstanding work so yeah. far. Uh, yes. For um, sure. So to start us off, we're talking about change. Pete, in your mind, what is the most exciting or scariest or both element of change? I think it is tropey to say uh, to say the words at this point, especially after the last several years of pandemic living, to say the words new normal. It is mm. definitely tropey. But for me, that phrase wraps up, sort of encapsulates all of the feelings I have about and the anxiety that I have about change. It is that I can deal with what's right in front of me, but I have a very difficult time uh, wrapping my head around that next corner after change happens. What does the new normal, what does the new world look like is just wrecked with anxiety for me. <laughs> yeah, the new normal, that's exactly right. And another way of saying that is it's just, it involves the unknown. By its yeah. own definition, that change has the potential for triumph or failure. And how you treat the unknown is really how you look at the idea of change. And yeah. it sounds like you and myself included are uncomfortable with the unknown. Even though when think when I've jumped into the unknown, wonderful things have come out of it. it still doesn't mm -hmm. take away my trepidation. A study was actually released. They sort of redo this study every once in a while. And it's the biggest uh, human fears are calculated. We're just going with the fear part. This isn't phobias. Uh, phobias is public speaking, number one, with a bullet, ATF. Uh, this is uh, human fears. Number one, fear of failure. Number two, fear of rejection. And right there at number three, fear of change. So yeah. in case you get worried about change, once again, even though this is a new podcast, you are not alone. Yes. So you said that you are nervous about the unknown, but... You're nervous about what is going because I because the new normal seems like it has stabilized. You would think, yeah, <laughs> but 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 the the <laughs> and and a lot of that is what I'm going to talk about later in the show. We're mm. going to talk about sort of the myths of happiness and adaptation, particularly around a, a hedonic adaptation teaser Whoa. that's coming later. We're going to talk all about that, but how we and how I personally look inside myself and and adapt to change around me. What do I do? What are the feelings? What is the physiological experience of change? Because that can mean a lot of different things. And, uh, and there is, a, frankly, a lot of controversy in terms of behavioral science and how we approach change and how we can be better at change and how we can look at change in a way that isn't full of fear. That's the stuff that really intrigues me. And yeah. so uh, this idea of normalizing change into this space that that is not today, but will soon be familiar 
is is the gap of anxiety, right? That's the right. gap between then and now. And I'm I'm a mess a mess with it. I you know <laughs> I I've talked way too much about um in past seasons about my dad passing away. I'll just say it reminds me now every time I think about that how I felt before one of my parents passed, which was I cannot rationalize a world in which I don't have my mom or dad. Oh. That world does I am it is so uncertain. Right. And now I've done it. Right. Now I've done it. And now I'm years past. And I understand what normalizing to that kind of significant change actually means. And uh, it, for me, is I that still fortifying? That you would think. You that, would think that's it would the be name of the game enormously. is to be like, look, yeah. I thought this was unknowable and now it's knowable and I'm still here yeah. and alive. But no, we've talked about using past success for future confidence is not our yes. major. <laughs> not one thing that we really <laughs> the are college good of at. life. Yeah. Yeah. And and so that's the that's the trick is feeling like now it's familiar. Now I know what it feels like when I kick myself in the knee. And <laughs> at some point I know I'm gonna kick myself in the knee again. Yeah. And, and now now in fact, now that I do know what it's like, that doesn't make it any better to to, to go into it again. Right. You know? <laughs> well, I wanted to put a name to the subject to change. Okay. Uh, I promise I won't and we won't be doing this every single week because this is supposed to be a departure from our, our anxiety ridden format. But there's a reason I want to bring up metathysophobia. You don't that you just made up that word. Meta Jesus, nope. Tom, I thought we were doing something different. Metathysio oh, metathysophobia. I said it wrong. <laughs> Metathesis meaning the transposition of letters of words or change. Okay. Phobos being the Greek god of yikes. And that's because it is almost always connected with tropophobia which is the fear of moving. In fact, some of the Latin or Greek phrasing that I found is indistinguishable from each other. So change and moving, like moving is at the top of that level with, of course, the uh, loss of a loved one uh, underneath. And I wanted to use all of this to tell a personal story of mine. This will touch upon certain uh, aspects that I've talked about in previous episodes, but not fully. It was my fear of moving apartments from one part of Los Angeles to my current part where I'm sitting right now with my dog in the valley. Uh, and my feelings about change and how they held me back and how I ultimately changed my life because of them, I think this is a good sort of encapsulation of it. Would you like to hear a little bit about it? Yeah, but when you say the valley, where is that? Like, how close is that to where Lois Lane fell into the crack in the earth in Superman? Uh, is that where Shake Shack is? <laughs> I don't know. Where, <laughs> I don't know where that is, but it's like it's over the hill. The west side is where I used to live. I lived about a 15-minute walk from UCLA, and now okay. I live about 20 minutes north of there, over what they call the Big Hill, into the valley. And the valley is that is, where the Hollywood sign is? That's where the, the big sure, hill. Sure, that's the Hollywood Hills. But yeah, I think that that's where okay. those things. It's I think porn was invented in the valley. That's where all of Magnolia, yeah. the movie Magnolia, takes place, is in the valley mm -hmm. for you PTA fans. Um, okay. Anyway, so I was on Sepulveda Boulevard, uh, and I found it with a friend of the show, Nicole Snacks Reynolds, and it was a 15-minute walk, as I said, from UCLA. It was close to major freeway entrances and exits. What was not to love, Pete? A ton, Pete. Oh. oh. <laughs> because I'm so easygoing and resistant to change, I didn't see the problems <laughs> as problems for years. Can I list just some of them? I would love to hear. Okay. It came with a fridge. This is very rare. I don't know if this is a different state thing, but it's very rare, or it was when I moved here in Southern California. No, everyone takes their fridges with them. No oh, places come. No, I don't understand that. No one comes furnished with a fridge. The fact that I had a fridge, he was like, I'll throw it in there and that'll just be an extra bonus. And I was like, dope. Forgetting that this was like not a fridge. This was like an ice box. Like it was just a <laughs> ridiculous old. Was it you, one of the coffin sized style ones that I, you open from the top? Yeah, that like yeah, that Leatherface hide a body bridge. In. This is yeah. the one that Indiana Jones jumped in in Indiana <laughs> Jones four when the atomic bomb went off. This was the first fridge. I think. Okay. Yeah, it was just called the refridge. Uh, so that was ridiculous. Um, the off ramp that I mentioned, I said that it's right near major the four hundred five and kind of near the one hundred one. There was an off ramp. Uh, right across the street from my apartment building that was a terribly designed <laughs> nightmare. It was so, you none of the lights, because it was at such a weird angle, none of the lights could see, none of the cars could see anyone else's lights. 
So it was really hard oh. until it was too late to see if you had a red light or a green light. My friends will attest there were so many crashes, and I mean weekly, not hyperbole. Every single week, at least once, there would be crash, so much so that I had in that horrible icebox, I kept crash water, meaning little <sighs> bottles of water that I would run outside and give to the sometimes injured parties while they waited for the hospital. Well, that is an act of extraordinary kindness, Tom. Let me I just call so. that out. I mean, you're that house, that, that apartment seems miserable. And right. yes, you should have moved. Yeah. I'm glad you did. But that is really not everybody does that. Well, they were super woozy. So like I'd go through their wallet, their purses. <laughs> it, it, it was a quid pro quo kind of thing. I was like, here, drink this, you idiot. And then they'd go to sleep. Um, the, you're or, slipping them something now? <laughs> yeah, weird, right? Go to sleep. That's so weird. But weirdly, it was just clarity. I was like, I don't want this dander. <laughs> your allergies dander. are going to be fine. Yeah. Um, Sorry about your leg, though. The, um, the original super, the superintendent there, he was replaced mm -hmm. at one point for having a little bit of a love for the sauce. He had one skill, and that was to fix problems with putting huge metal plates over them. Screw to the wall, metal plates. <laughs> so, like, at one point, I found that I had a little bit of maybe black mold. And Ooh. he just scooped it out. And in my kitchen, you just had a huge metal plate. And then on a ceiling, there was a leak. He dug it out, put a huge metal plate. By the time I moved, there, <laughs> there was a metal plate in every single room. And yet I was still like, yep, this is what living is. <laughs> Suddenly you're living in like the low rent extra set from Cube. <laughs> 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 and it was filled with traps. Yeah. <laughs> the closet was filled with like a, an acid spray. And I was like, well, yeah. big city awesome. living. And, <laughs> Laser garage. Mm. And there was no air conditioning. And that was actually the final straw oh. because I had a window unit, like a really kind of janky window unit that would at least make things livable. Because in the summer, mm -hmm. for the two years that I had before I got the window unit, <laughs> Again, this is about change and my resistance to change. There would be times that I would read at night in my tub, my empty tub, because it was cool and porcelain. Like that was the coolest place in the wow. entire apartment. And then they banned all window units. They said, no more air conditioning. It's really hurting the integrity of this goddamn shanty town. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I finally, that was finally the push. I was like, okay, I need, it's time to move. <laughs> AC, you, AC. You sound like the saddest version of Holden Caulfield I've ever heard. <laughs> like, there's just something about I'm just a brave boy making my way in the world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now I'm reading in a tub. I'm reading in a tub, and then this phony comes and puts another metal plate in the wall. <laughs> phonies, phonies. That's really all I remember about the book. Um, and so it finally got me to search, and I was there for like years and years and years and years. Oh, <laughs> another thing that I just remembered that I did not make a note about. And this was one that I had friends that sort of took over the super job and they were horrified that I'd never uh, listed this as a problem. Mm -hmm. The g stove was like gas, but it wouldn't ignite right away. So you turn the gas on and then have to like run away a little bit because it would fill with gas and then the burner would happen and the door would go and fly open releasing like a little flame of gas and i said big city living pete what is wrong oh, with me oh my god because i didn't Tom, want big to cities change. have solved that i know i don't i know that's actually very small city dumb yeah and so I searched around another friend of the show, Johnny GD Jackaloni. He mm -hmm. found me this place that I'm placed right now in my life. So I was really resistant and the move was really hard. And I was really scared the first night that I stayed here, not scared of like the dark, but like, okay, this is the new normal. Where are the other shoes? Where are they dropping? They never dropped my life mm -hmm. forever leveled up. I had a dishwasher for the first time. I had responsive superintendents. There is not a metal plate anywhere in the vicinity. <laughs> and of course, the biggest, oh, uh, central AC. And of course, the biggest change sitting behind me, my old building didn't allow dogs. And it wasn't until mm. I moved to my current place that I met the furry love of my life, Foster. One of yeah. the refrains that people say is, how could you have lived so long with not having a dog? And I'm like, I think it was change. It was responsibility. Yeah. It was change. It was unknown. Now it's unthinkable yeah, to not have a dog. Sure. And I've put him right. in stories. Like I've put him in stories in yes. the, like he would carry out the crash water in his dumb little of mouth. Of course. And stuff yeah. like that. He has, I mean, he has a little barrel under his neck yeah. that he wears around his neck. It's just Gatorade. 
Yeah. So that's the kind of situation. That's a good encapsulation of I was dealing with so much under the guise of I'm easygoing. Look, I don't need mm -hmm. much from my life, but I think a lot can hide. A lot of fear for me can hide. If you're not easygoing, you're just afraid of taking that next step. And I learned everything is just so much better. It's so much better yeah, up here. Right, right. And it turns out the shoes dropping, like your old apartment was literally ceilinged with metal plates and shoes. <laughs> like at any moment, those shoes could stop. But you were so used right. to it. Shoes were like dropping around me. Normal. Yeah, you're right. Yes. There was a whole right, collection of right, crash shoes it. right outside on the sidewalk. Yeah, it's all about, the, and some of them might have had feet. Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> so gross. So gross, but <laughs> weirdly profitable. So that's yeah. the real big change. Is I have learned. I'm always still learning all of this, but I'm learning to try to change my change my viewpoint going into it. That I want to be like, oh, change is exciting, is an opportunity, not change is having to go through the fire. That's sort of the, right. the name of the game. Uh, a professor on verywellmind.com, I don't recommend it, uh, points to your mindset when experiencing change, <laughs> says automatic negative thinking patterns can undermine your ability to focus on the positive. When negative thoughts bog you down, it's more challenging to have faith in your coping abilities. I think that's what I was doing. So I was just pushing it away, yes. pushing it away. Cognitive reframing is a technique that can help people change these negative thoughts. It's a strategy you can utilize in your day-to-day -day life to help look at situations with a more realistic and most importantly, hopeful attitude. That's sort of the thing that I know I need. I know that's not what everyone needs for change. I need to immediately go, change is coming and change is always coming. I, we are both mm -hmm. involved in very moving and changing like i just directed in front of a green screen for the very first time i'd never done that before sure for young storytellers and it was great and i was a little nervous going into it but i was thrilling and i loved it and now that's another thing uh under my belt in my belt there's another notch on my tombstone i don't know the phrase uh tombstone. it's more brisket for the barbecue <laughs> i'm still gonna make that work um so that's you know what's interesting yeah. to me? Can I uh, observation? 100%. The, one of the things that I think you uh, you are really highlighting, and, and if we're looking at this conversation as an exploration of what we do to ourselves to either mm -hmm. avoid or embrace change personally, um, it's it's this like all or nothing thinking, right? That binary thinking that I can't move. Can't is a binary word. It's either you can or you can't. Oh. You're not open to the gray of possibility, right? There are lots of horizons when you look out into the future. You're, and if you say, I can't move because you're not open to the fact that, yeah, some things might not be as great. I don't know how in your example, but some <laughs> things in that future might not be as great, yeah. but a lot of things could be better. Yeah. But if we stop at the, I can't move because, right. then we never know. Right. We never get to explore it. And that's the part that I think is so interesting to me is how often do I sit and think, I can't, I can't do that. I can't, we have to get new carpet. Like we have to, our carpet is a disaster. <laughs> You've been here, giant pet related holes in the stairs. It's just nasty. <laughs> we vacuum it all the time. Now we're like vacuuming subfloor. And <laughs> so we can keep putting band-aids on this 30 year old carpet or we can just change it. But in my head, I find that's an example of binary thinking. Oh, God, we can't do that. Look at all the floor we'll have to pull right. up. Look at all the, what are we going to do with all the furniture that we have to move around so they can come do that? What do we do with this piano sitting in the corner? What do we do with all of the things right. that get in the way of an easy transformation without ever even asking the question of the people who put the carpet in? What do you do with carpet when you normally do stuff right. like How do this? You... Like they would know, but I don't ask the question right. because I'm an idiot. Because well, you think it's stuff, all up right? to you and you're taking it on yeah. all at once. One of the big things that 100%. helped me in my move for the change involving the move was to start bite-sizing it. Not be uh -huh. like, I'm moving my entire apartment is today I'm moving this room. Because I yes. had like I had like a two week overlap, which was really nice. And I said, every oh, yeah, you have the luxury of it was piece incredible. By piece. I, and every because I had to do a big I wanted to do a big purge, even though I was moving into a bigger place. So I wasn't allowed to leave my apartment without taking a box of books or clothes that I was mm -hmm. donating. And then just that just really makes a big deal. Um, it makes it Huge. so much easier when you bite size and organize, because then, yeah, I think what makes it binary is when you're trying to take it on all at once. 
And then you just have yeah. decision fatigue and you freeze up and vapor lock and oh, Netflix um, or gin, <laughs> Netflix and gin. That's my version <laughs> of Netflix and, and chill. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Netflix and bourbon and cry. Um, it's a three part process. <laughs> Uh, no. And I've really learned, and that's something that I really try to hold on to is to remember, take it down. Even sometimes it really helps me to write it down, write down each part of it, because then, yes. then you have the beauty of also with change, checking things off of a list. Oh, and sometimes I'll just make like a one thing into three steps for no reason other than I can just check off more things. Yeah. 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 I, I, when I think about that, I look at like, am, have I broken this thing down into its smallest atomic elements? I love thinking in terms of, of atomic elements. And then I saw Oppenheimer and that made it okay. <laughs> so I think about like, what is the, what is the, the verb, right? That I have to do? What is the noun? And how do I have to feel about it when I'm done? Like, if I can just look at those three terms, then I normally can um, find a way to get through the project. There are still some things that I just call clogging tasks that they just get in the way. The nice thing about clogging tasks is that I can, when I finally get around to doing them, when I adapt to the, to the, you know, horrors of whatever new normal is in my head and do them, normally they unlock so much stuff, mm. so much cognitive load on the back end that I can, I, I find myself so emotionally just relieved right. at the act of, of making a hard choice of, of embracing change right. in, in a way that, and it just happens very like, so I think I'm going to say this a lot this time, change happens very slowly. And then, and all, then at all at once. once. And it's yeah. never as hard as you think it will. It no, can't be because never. you've never really defined what the problem is going to be. I, that's a great point. I've never defined the problem specifically. I've only defined how I feel about right. it. Right. And so if, which is, yeah, because like what, amorphous. what are the shoes that I was worried about? The road yeah. will disappear. Like, what am I talking about? It's an apartment. <laughs> it's got to be safer and better. And now I live outside of a, yeah, yeah, now I have a park and all that stuff. So yeah, that's where I am. And it sounds like you're in the same place. I fear change, but then I thrive on overcoming it. And learning how to adapt in the name of the game, then that is, is it all leads to resilience. So it's a really weird mix. It's a real push and pull that I have, but I'd like to think that I'm getting better at it. And the apartment is a good example of that. To wrap up this part, can I just read one little thing? Remember that professor on verywellmind.com? I don't recommend it. Yeah. This was just, yeah. <laughs> this is just one sentence in the article that for some reason makes me laugh because it seems very specific. Change, whether it's positive or negative, can create stress that affects both your physical and mental well-being. Sometimes this can lead to headaches. <laughs> Doesn't that just seem like I'm pretty sure the professor had a headache at the time? <laughs> like, it, it, she opens up the world yeah. and then she's like, yeah, and then you got a head scratcher. <laughs> I, just, I thought that was so funny. I wanted to share that. So everybody. Like you could he hear the bottle of Advil shaking <laughs> as you read totally. it. Uh, so yeah, everybody uh, get rid of those headaches and do your best with change. <laughs> now I hear you can take like nine of those things before it really does damage on your kidneys. Oh yeah, and then, that, Go to and then that's change. <laughs> There was a time long ago that crossing the ocean involved, nay, required getting on a boat. The original ocean liners took somewhere between five days and a strong clip to eight days to cross the Atlantic. Plenty of time for those classic Jack and Rose bowward shenanigans of old. And don't get me wrong, those ships were lovely, designed to offer every amenity passengers were accustomed to on land at sea. If you were wealthy, you could shoot skeet off the bow and eat five-star meals. If you were poor, you could eat the rats with the hobos in stowage, just like you'd get on land. But the goal of those trips wasn't the voyage. The goal was the destination. Ocean liners got bigger and faster in the following decades, but struggled to keep up with innovation in another important direction. Ships were fair at turning left and right and going straight ahead, but ask any salty captain, the one direction in which liners truly struggled to compete was up. In the 1950s, the trip from New York to London by plane took 15 hours. By the swinging 60s, new passenger jets cut that trip in half. And seven hours is a hell of a lot faster than... Does math. Carries one. But 192 hours by ocean liner. 
the ocean-going passenger industry languished for decades. That is, until 1979. That was the year that Norwegian Cruise Line threw $80 million at the SS France, a rusty old ocean liner at the time, and rechristened it the SS Norway. Along the way, they changed... That's more math. Everything. And for the first time in the history of seafaring, the large-scale cruise ship as destination in and of itself was born. And then it splashed about a bit. But the timing was right and coincident to a very important television show, the industry transformation gained speed. Bigger ships, and then bigger ships than those big ships, and then even bigger ships than those bigger ships hit the waves. The SS Norway had increased her passenger capacity to 2,565. It was already marketed as a floating city. Today, that number isn't competitive by a wide margin. The wonder of the seas from Royal Caribbean International boasts maximum passenger occupancy of 6,988 and a length of 1,187 feet. In fact, you have to drop to number 18 on the list of largest ships in service to even hit the first with a sub-6,000 occupancy. These things are absurd. And just as the passenger ocean liner ceded its role in ferrying passengers across the sea, the modern cruise ship changed the world. Port destinations along the Caribbean and South America flourished with new vibrant tourist economies, as did coastlines around the world. Amenities fully rivaled the greatest terrestrial resort destinations, and by all appearances, this year looks to be a very strong year, after a few very dark years in the shadow of COVID. As with so much change, the years from 1975 through 1985 marched slowly, and then very, very fast as our perception of what you could do on a big boat transformed. Oh, and for kids like me, that really super consequential television show? Yeah, Julie, the cruise director on The Love Boat, changed just about everything from my perspective of shipping, too. Want to experience change in your life, but don't want to wait for the kind of industrial scale reshaping of the universe like what hit the entire cruise industry? become a feeling friend today. Okay, you may know it as Panic Pals, sure, but we're still the same great princes of diminishing returns that you've come to know and love. And for just $35, you'll get access to the member live stream when we record, early access to the shows and your very own member podcast feed, our latest batch of stickers, and a present from Tom, the classic ATF bingo card. Visit our fancy new URL for the show, allthefeelings.fun today. Uh, Tom. Hello. Tom. Hello. Hey, come back. Come back to the show, Tom. Oh. What do you know of uh, the word hedonic? When you think of hedonic, what do you what do you think about? Is that related to hedonism? Related. Hed a hedonist is someone that I believe. I think it has a sinful or negative connotation, but I think it's just someone that maybe lives for feeling. Lives yeah, for. Yeah, that's actually great. And I'm glad oh. you said it that way. That, oh, that's good. actually really good. That de technically it's relating to or considered in terms of pleasant or unpleasant sensations. Oh. Right. And I think that's a really interesting concept, right? The concept of hedonism not being strictly related to uh, sin. And I think it has, it carries a, a, a moral weight right. to it, the word hedonism. A hedonist but, is someone that only cares about themselves. Yes. Right. Yes, for sure. Now, I, I stumbled on this term uh, uh, some time ago. It's called uh, hedonic adaptation or the hedonic treadmill. And I want to say before I get into this and before somebody listens to it and says, oh, but that was debunked. I'm going to say, yeah, I know. I know it was debunked. We're going to talk about it anyway, because <laughs> I actually there's, think that there's some stuff to learn. Oh, OK. <laughs> but is that how, how's that? Is, that's that good? I mean, we had we, we quoted, are a show. <laughs> we quoted <laughs> from we? a a hundred percent plagiarist <laughs> before. Yeah, once that's it. In real so time, I feel like this so, is this yeah. is on brand, and I I wonder how if you'll if you'll agree with me that there I think are some things to learn, and and the way it was debunked is controversial, right? Mm. Like as is everything. There's a lot of gray. Okay, but the concepts sit really well with me in terms of how I think about myself, and that's what I want to talk about with you. So, the hedonic adaptation concept. Uh, refers to the tendency of human beings 
to very quickly return to a relatively stable level, like emotional baseline, despite major milestones of positive or negative events or, or life changes, right? So a change happens, and even though it's a lot of fluctuation, you go back to your base? Yeah. Is that? Okay, yeah. got it. I, I just go back to, sure to a base, right? Like, and so it questions how well we as humans adapt to changing mm. events over time. Uh, and so I imagine, like, uh, as it happens, this is a total sidebar. I watched this other video on YouTube, as I want to do, of mm -hmm. a young computer scientist who decided that he was going to use all of his computer science training and knowledge as a side, as a project for school, I guess, to actually code his own AI model based on the image generation models of stable diffusion. You know how you can, you can, use text to generate images. Right. He wanted to build an OnlyFans page out of a beautiful woman that didn't exist. But oh. it's really hard, it turns out, from a computer science perspective, to get the same woman to show up every time you generate this model, yeah. right? The face is a little different. So he had to train the model. And in the process of watching this video, bringing it back to hedonic adaptation, he shows this graph. And the graph is the X and Y axis. And there's a diagonal line from the origin going all the way up, diagonal sort of bisecting those two axes. And in the way I think about it, if you look at that as your trajectory of happiness, your emotional baseline, and time is on the x-axis and your events are on the y-axis, mm -hmm. and a negative thing happens, then your curve divert, diverts from the from the, the your general path and over time as other events occur the you know to to you it normalizes and so you get this sort of wave on top of this flat line that is constantly moving against I get it. normal because it's changes but then you go back changes but then base. Yes. changes changes but then go equalize. back it's that's like a good way to plucking, say equalize. yeah it plucks you're plucking your emotional guitar string right the oh. string is taut and then you pluck it and it vibrates and it doesn't vibrate just up and down it vibrates it oscillates right so different parts of the string are vibrating at at, at high than other parts of the string that are low and it, it that's just vibrations are amazing right mm -hmm. and that's what i think about when i think about hedonic adaptation and the idea is that over time eventually like the guitar string if it is uninterrupted gets silent so do you adapt back to your baseline? When not, so are we when on not, the same page? When not plucked or faced with changes. Yes. Got it. Right. A hedonic adaptation can come around in a, a number of ways involving cognitive changes, such as, you know, you have shifting values over time, right? Suddenly, maybe it's political. We are in a very vibrant landscape of political ideology in this country. And, <laughs> vibrant. That's uh, a nice way to say it. <laughs> and so maybe you're ideologies are shifting slowly. Events then, like big events in time, are like plucking the string very, very hard. But they will always normalize to closer to your original and than maybe we anticipated. At least that's what Philip Brickman and Donald T. Campbell in their essay, Hedonic Relativism and Planning the Good Society, oh. said in 1971 that in fact it's hedonic treadmill or the, the hedonic adaptation was, uh, you know, really said that we have this tendency uh, of people to maintain a fairly stable baseline uh, of happiness and uh, sadness, despite external events and fluctuations in demographic circumstances. Now, this was in the 70s, right? So, Is there a little parentheses at the end of the title that says, please don't debunk us? <laughs> 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 we like this idea. Please don't debunk us. That would be the saddest thing. Well, and that's the hardest part about it, right? Is that it actually sounds pretty fair, right? Right. It, it sounds like something you could wrap your head around. Yeah. Uh, and so, of course, because it sounds rational, they start thinking a lot about it. And, you know, they, the you know, the boffins in uh, high towers. Mm. Uh, and so you start looking at it and, and, you know, these early studies are all, they define kind of our cultural acceptance of these things like lottery winners and accident victims is happiness relative, right? You just talked about all of the, mm. the crash water out in front of your old apartment, <laughs> right? So, yeah. Like how, when you look at this study comparing happiness levels of lottery winners and paraplegics, 
And they did this. They com- made those comparisons to a control group. They found that after the initial impact of extremely positive or extraordinarily negative events, happiness typically levels out at oh. their original average levels. They're talking about, yeah, uh, people who were paralyzed, people who lost limbs, and people who won all of the all of the great money in the lottery. That eventually their levels, their emotional baseline leveled out. What do you think about that? Like, how does that apply to you? I'll respond by saying the very first thing without thinking it through the whole way, as is mm-hmm. my want. Ooh, um, <laughs> shoot from the hip, Tommy, ATF, is um, there's something calming about that. As someone that is on the record of not trusting or fearing change, the idea of I am willing to miss some of the high if I don't have to go through the low for as long. That if there is sort of a uh, smoothing out of things, that that's calming. There's some comfort to be found. I think that's fair. I absolutely think that's fair, right? The, The studies that have come on after it really get to this question of what are the constituent elements that define our baseline? Mm-hmm. In the early 70s, one of the constituent elements is is a cultural homogeneity in those early studies that they weren't really taking into effect, like an accident victim and a lottery winner. But if they come from the same socioeconomic or uh, economic or cultural base themselves, then oh. maybe, yes, they would kind of normalize to the same level relative to one another and right. their own experiences. But two other researchers, like an Intelligent in 1996, conducted a 10-year study on sets of twins that almost 50% of our happiness levels are determined by genetics. Hetty and Weering in 1989 also suggested that our position on the spectrum of the stable personality traits, and those include neuroticism, extroversion, and openness to experience, Mm -hmm. accounts for how we experience and perceive individual life events and indirectly uh, contributes to our happiness levels. So they're saying, look, so what you're bringing to the it. table also. Yeah. Right. But you have, you can't just look at, at, you can't assume emotional baseline and then only look at the events that happen that are extremely positive or extraordinarily negative. Right. right? All of that matters. But what this gets to for me is looking at how I personally adapt to change when the change is in, involves so much uncertainty, not explicitly a happy or sad event, mm-hmm. because I, I try to stay pretty even keel on like that, that thing happened. And whether it makes me happy or sad is up to me. It is a thing that happened. That's kind of a mantra I'm trying to get behind. Okay. Um, that trying to remove emotional weight from specific events. That's really hard. I'm, I'm pretty new on that path, yeah. but, but I'm trying to to think that way. I I think that being able to be resilient in the face of events, happy or sad, yeah, that's that's what that's what we're trying to get to, right? We're trying to get to this idea and challenge the myth that happiness only occurs when certain events happen. Happiness Mm. only occurs on Christmas morning when you're a 13 year old in a privileged uh, upper middle class neighborhood in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, But by the same token, well, you know, it's a John Hughes movie. Happiness is a John Hughes movie. Okay. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But but the other myth is that negative events make us permanently unhappy, right? Like divorce, death of a spouse or a parent, unfulfilled dreams, like all of those things, that that's also a myth Mm -hmm. that we have to counter by evaluating how we look at, at sudden events that happen in our own lives. And so I turn it to you. Does this trigger anything for you about how you relate to sudden either gifts of, of positive events or tragedy or grief? Very much so. Uh, I am a firm believer in time heals. Mm -hmm. Not all wounds, but time smooths out woundies. That's my new phrase. (laughs) That is not going to be a t-shirt, folks. Uh, I don't know why I said woundies. It's absolutely going to be a t-shirt. Well, because I I wasn't at the end of... note. Yeah, I didn't get to the end of my brain. (laughs) Yeah, I think I am a believer in that time will heal. Things mm-hmm. will get easier. Things will always get better um, or at least normalize. Maybe I shouldn't put mm-hmm. positive, negative connotations on it, but this will not feel like this forever. Well, yeah, 
Well, but that's not exactly true because there's things that we've even talked about embarrassments or regrets that I've had that still can show up at one yeah. in the morning and be but like, oh, different. no. <laughs> right. But they're different. Right. Even things of great events of great sadness or loss or grief. Right. Eventually, there's a time where you're able to separate. Yes. I, I guess if you're doing the work, you're able to separate the the weight of the grief from the experience itself and say, Correct. you know what? I think I'm finished being sad. Right. I think I can I can recognize the loss in my life, loss of a loved one, loss of a of a spouse, whatever. I can recognize that as loss. And mm -hmm. and that can hurt, that can be present with me, but I'm through being sad on the daily. Right. I it, you've reached a certain type of I guess control. Oh. Yeah. You're not right. you're not beheld, you're not at the whim of those emotions. You're able to see those emotions for what they are, feel the emotions, but you are on top of it. Instead of being yes. sort of thrown in, like lashing out at things, or all of a sudden an Adidas commercial makes you cry. That's just me. All the time, every day. What? All the you, time. Don't get that, you don't get that alone. What? <laughs> Look, here's the other question that I have for you that all this inspires. And I yeah. think this is another controversial question, especially for people who are existing right now in an experience of grief. Mm -hmm. um, how much do you feel like happiness is a choice? Man. That question sucks. I don't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would love to say that it's a choice and I would love to be able to live my life that way, but it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. I mean, it makes me angry. There was this guy in college when I went to see you, when we went to see you, walk yeah, by. We and if you were ever like, he would walk, his thing was to go smile. Or smile oh, more as he passed yeah. you. And I was like, you're a dead man. I didn't ever say that. But <laughs> um, but like that type of just band-aid it, whatever you're going through, that is very gross to me because that I yeah. think that sort of lacks sympathy, that lacks empathy. Um, Certainly empathy, yeah. I do believe that happiness can be a choice, but that's also an incredibly easier thing said than done. Yes. It would take yeah. an I enormous amount of work and practice and therapy and the aforementioned bourbon and all of that to be able to just be like, okay, well, I've, I'm done now and I'm happy. There is something to it. And we've talked about it on the show in seasons past, this whole idea that, you know, there, there is a chemical change that happens when you smile. And if you smile enough, you make it habitual and eventually you change the thing. So you can, you can affect your mood. We know this by right. certain physiological things, but, um, I, I do. I'm, I'm just not sure that that saying choose to be happy is the way to get through certain negative events is the way to to push yourself through hedonic adaptation, which brings to question again, like why hedonic hedonic adaptation is is controversial because right. of all these things that go into it that are more than just the event. You know, it, it again, trophy. We are more than the sum of our parts, right? Mm -hmm. We're the more than the sum of our experiences, and I, never is that more true than right here when we're dealing with significant adaptation Changes. to change. Right? Yeah. the The research leans in heavily in one specific area, and I know uh, it, it's around happiness and parenthood because oh. that's another one of those things that people apparently really hang their hats on. Like, I'll be happy when I have kids. Right. Really? And yeah, <laughs> that's no, what that's people a, think. That's a thing. <laughs> OK. But it turns out the relationship between happiness and having kids is very, very complex. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, you know, studies, different studies show different findings, contradictory findings on whether parents are happier than non-parents. Right. Um, happiness in parents depends on a lot of things uh, like the age of the parent versus the child and mm -hmm. marital status and child custody situations and child's behavior and emotional well-being and uh, a child's I, I think overall it's, uh, crappiness parent. <laughs> yes, like yes. some kids are just straight up losers. Right. Yep. Right. <laughs> like, like some of the, you know, I sometimes compare parenting to, uh, to writing, right? Like I, I don't love writing on the daily, but I absolutely love having written. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, the actual doing you know, of it is, isn't yeah. 
always it's right. more of a chore right. and then you get and to we're and we happen to be in the very, very lucky place where our children are kind of going out into the world on their own. And so right. my memories of being a parent are very positive right now. I love having gone through the last 17, 18 years, you know, yeah. uh, and uh, also time heals all wounds. I have put a lot <laughs> behind me. Yeah. <laughs> There's our old band aid time again. <laughs> my kids aren't feeling friends, right? They're not going to hear this. <laughs> Anyway, so the bottom line is, and I, I just, if there's any message to leave after this exploration into this controversially criticized theory of hedonic adaptation, yeah. I actually find I like the idea of it Me too. interpersonally. I like the idea of when something happens, observing in me how I change myself. Like, how do I adapt and yeah. how do I find a new normal through through, you know, big consequential events in my life. But the research says happiness itself, happiness and depression and desperation, whatever, doesn't come from a single, a single event. It is a complex, you know, permeable, you know, mutable state of, of emotions or yeah. collection of emotions that all goes into this. And, and I think understanding all of those things, at least working to to understand those things in yourself can might just lead you to a richer life. Or <laughs> I'm still looking for that other shoe. <laughs> Sonnets to Orpheus, Part 2, 12, by Rainer Maria Rilke. Want the change. Be inspired by the flame where everything shines as it disappears. The artist, when sketching, loves nothing so much as the curve of the body as it turns away. What locks itself in sameness has congealed. Is it safer to be gray and numb? What turns hard becomes rigid and is easily shattered. Pour yourself out like a fountain. Flow into the knowledge that what you are seeking finishes often at the start and with ending begins. Every happiness is the child of a separation it did not think it could survive. Thank you, everybody, for joining us in this first exploration of change for this show, our new sort of new format. It does. I don't know. We just recorded it. It feels kind of familiar to me, Tom. Yeah. We hope that this illuminates some some new thinking in you. And we hope that you also will share your thoughts and feelings. We would love, love, love nothing more than to hear from you. Uh, we do have a public Discord channel and our Discord server at True Story FM. Link in the show notes. We also have a form where you can submit your thoughts and feelings about the show, about thoughts and feelings, whatever you want. Uh, and you can find that at allthefeelings.fun. Yes, that's a real website. And <laughs> it's not the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. <laughs> but that would be the best if they had a sense of humor enough yeah. to have. We're also going to put a link to the Bureau <laughs> in yeah, there just course. to cover all your bases. Yeah. Links, links matter. Please like and subscribe at the Bureau. Uh, the tune this week that you've been listening to is Change the Mood by Above Envy. Coming up next week. What's next week, Tom? Next week, we are changing from change and going to our old pal. We might just play an old episode of this dumb podcast. <laughs> we are going to be tackling embarrassment. So, of course, if you have a certain embarrassing story, you don't have to give us your name, but you can give us your story and we will invite everyone to cringe along with you. Next week, embarrassment. Until then, I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Tommy Mess the Third. Thank you so much for downloading and joining us for season eight. We will be back next week with all the feeling. You change the mood when you're working with a smile. Yes, you do. I haven't been happy for a while. To be honest, I feel less moving all my feelings around. I just but you. You change the mood. You 
Da-da-da-da-da-da. <laughs>